from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 217, recorded live Thursday, June 10th, 2010. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Control, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Javier Lozano about MVC Turbine and IOC. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And today I'm sitting down with Javier Lozano, the author of MVC Turbine. How's it going, sir? Great, Scott. Thanks for having me on, on board. No worries. So talk to me about MVC Turbine, because I, I'm an MVC person. I like ASP.NET MVC. But uh, when I put out samples and when I start new applications, people are always saying that uh, I should use inversion of control and auto-wire up my controllers. And it always seems like a huge hassle. And is MVC Turbine something that, that bridges that the gap between it's a hassle and what comes out of the box? Yeah, it does. Uh, one of the things that MVC Turbine provides to the developer is um, composition through use of IOCs. So, um, for example, you mentioned about plugging your IOC container to get controllers out of it or view engines and so forth. Well, manually, you have to, for, to get that working on ASP.NET and MVC, you have to actually plug into the runtime and you have to, first of all, know the runtime and know specifically where to plug it in. Um, Turbine kind of removes that headache by plugging itself into the runtime and um, eagerly uh, fetching uh, types that it cares about, such as view engines and controllers and so forth. So it kind of takes you a step ahead from what um, you will have to do manually, which is not hard, but it's just, you know, extra work. So, but give me a sense though of what, what I would need to do manually and why I would want to do it. I mean, let's say I sit down, I go file a new project, I've got myself a nice ASP.NET MVC project. If I type in the URL slash home slash about, it's automatically going to use the default controller factory and it's going to go off and find the home controller and it'll do a little, I mean, I mean, I didn't new up the controller, right? So someone's doing that work for me. Why would I need uh, to get in some IOC at that point? You bring up a very good point. The the thing that it does, though, is that uh, in most cases, depending on what you're doing, for, like, for example, in your home about, you're not really doing anything that require any extra information. But say, for example, in the home about, you may want to fetch in data out of the uh, out of a database or some other resource. Um, at that point, you're, you're going to have to connect to that resource. So by... One way of doing it is by injecting that, that piece, you know, uh, let's call it a repository, right? Into, into your controller and be able to get that so you can test it and, and, and manage it differently. Well, for you to do that out of the box, the default, um, controller factory breaks because it, it uses activator that created instance behind, behind the scenes. So, um, for you to actually, you know, get into the, Specifics of that, either A, you're going to have to create uh, sorry, a class that inherits from the default controller factory and kind of override some of the methods and, and check if it's the right controller and otherwise, you know, build up the, um, the controller manually. Or you can just use a controller factory that's automatically wired up with an IOC and, and have it give you those specifics. Okay. Uh, and in either way, and, and and if say if your controller doesn't have doesn't have a dependencies, um, the the IOC container is smart enough to say, oh well, I'm going to create a, a controller with you know with no dependencies because it just has a plain old default constructor. Okay, so that you're saying a couple things here. Then first, that the default controller factory that comes with ASP.NET MVC is fairly uh, simplistic. I was going to say stupid, but I'll say simplistic, and is a basic convention, ba- uh, convention based factory, but it uses activator.create instance underneath it, which makes it, you know, very, you know, basically a hard coded convention style factory. And if I want to do anything at all that's, that's different, anything tricky, inject any dependencies at all, I'm going to replace that factory anyway. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So then why, let's, let's say I pick a, an IOC container. Let's say that I decide that I want to use, um, Unity which is a, an open source thing from Microsoft. 
why don't I just hook up Unity in my application? Where, why do I need MVC Turbine? What is it? What does MVC Turbine buy me? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, if, if you just want IOC for, uh, your controllers, and like you said, you can use Tur- uh, Unity to, as a, as a controller factor and it would work just fine. The, 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 I will say the added value that Turbine gives you is that, um, it provides the application that's running it, uh, a, a piece of composition. Outside of a just controller or or any other item within the ASP.NET framework, and what I mean by composition, I mean um, one of the concepts that Turbine has uh, sort of to play on the whole theme of of the name is something called a blade, which what it, what I use it for and what Turbine uses it for is for a cross cutting concern injection into your application. Okay. So, for example, um, logging. Right, uh, we all do. We all do logging in one way, shape, or form, whether it's console that right line or, or if, or using something as robust as log for net. Mm-hmm. Well, otherwise, uh, right now for you to, to configure it into your application and within the app start, you're going to have to configure log for net. You have to put all this code, all the ceremony around it for it to work. Well, with a blade, I can be very specific and say, all right, all this code that is required to initiate Log for net or my logging of choice will go inside this blade. Um, so at the runtime, when your MVC turbine application starts, it says, Oh, get me all the blades that I found in, in the bin directory. And it will, I will gather them all up, spin them up and say, Okay, blade, you do your thing. You do your thing. You do your thing. And, um, out of the box, you don't have to worry about having that functionality. So now once you've written it once, you can literally use that blade across any application that's using ABC Turbine. Okay, and this implements an interface of yours? Yeah, this implements a uh, a basic uh, interface called iBlade, and actually there's an abstract class called the Blade that provides some basic getters and setters implementations. So um, the MVC Turbine Runtime is smart enough to go say, oh, I need to scan all these blades, you know, and hydrate them out of actually the IOC container. Um, and then iterates through them and, and calls them individually and process them. Okay. You have to talk to me like I'm, a, like I've never done this before because I, I definitely want to understand the, what the listener is going to do with this. Cause maybe the listener uses IOC today. You figure mm-hmm. that we've probably got it split down the middle. We've got people out there that have got their favorite IOC, their favorite inversion of control stuff that they use now. They have their existing techniques that they like to use around dependency injection. And then you've got the the folks that have been listening to everyone talking about inversion of control and dependency injection for years, but have never gotten around to it. So to the person who's listening who has never decided to take that leap, is MVC Turbine going to make it less scary? Uh, it, it can. And the reason why I say it can is because out of the box, um, it, it does things for you. So um, it, another piece of Turbine um, that allows you to do is you can do uh, have what I call uh, uh, a poor man's or, or really layman's uh, registration for types. So say, for example, you, you need a I I foo service that will, re, you know, return a list of foos for you. Um, Turbine will have, has an API for you to do very simple registration to that example. So it's sort of a, it's a small steps towards that, um, understanding of what IOC provides and, um, and how you can get best, um, leverages and so forth. Now it's, it doesn't provide all the features such as um, Unity or Structure Map or an Inject does out of the box. Again, it's very, very simple. It's mostly used by Turbine, not by the end user. Um, however, as this developer who's, you know, slowly getting into it and saying, oh, wow, this, you know, this thing is just working. I can just tell it that I need an IFU service, give it an implementation and so forth. All that's magically working. And at the same time, say they, they want to learn about Unity. Mm-hmm. They can start learning more about Unity and literally taking some of those pieces and saying, okay, I don't want Turbine to register these pieces. I want Unity to do it. And they can actually um, spin up the code, uh, you know, whatever in their app to say, oh, here's my registrations. And 
and here's the Unity container. You know, they can manually create their Unity container mm -hmm. and then pass that container into Turbine. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. So if you don't really care about it, let Turbine handle it and, and it will do it to the best of its abilities. But if you really do care about um, how the registration is done and how it should be implemented, you can do that within your own container and then give it to Turbine to kind of handle the, the, uh, the, the other pieces of the framework. Okay, so let me let me try to paraphrase some things because that that'll mean that I'll either understand it or I won't understand it. So let me see if I can paraphrase what's going on here. So with a plain MVC application, you say file new and you get ASP.NET MVC, but there's no built-in inversion control, no dependency injection. If your home controller needs to have an iLogger or an iDatabase or whatever, you're going to have to give it to it somehow. And this this is where we start talking about the dependency chain. How how does that uh, iFu, i whatever get into my my home controller? Is it the home controller's responsibility to go off and make an iFu, or is it someone else's responsibility? If you invert the control and you uh, then the home controller simply receives one of these iFus, one of them appears out of the out of the ether, and that's handled by an inversion of control framework, and if it has some dependencies, it wants an iFu, an iFu wants an iBar, and et cetera, et cetera, you're letting an external system, you're inverting control and letting an, an external system decide who, uh, decide to make those for you, so that you'll never actually go and say var foo equals new foo service inside of your controllers. So that's what the, the whole thing behind uh, dependency injection and inversion control is. Then there's lots and lots of different frameworks out there. There's Unity and there's Structure Map and there's Windsor and on and on and on. And they all do things slightly differently, but they all do effectively the same thing. It's just that people like them for for various reasons. Am I am I right so far? Oh yeah, you're you're, you're dead on. It, it's okay. at the end of the at the end of the day, it's about developer preference. Okay, and then the, the controller factory inside of ASP.NET MVC is the factory that makes controllers. So when you say slash home slash about it's the thing that looks at that route map and says, gosh, I need to go and get a controller instance, and then it decides how to make that. Except if my controller needs something. It needs an iFu, it needs a database connection, on and on and on. Then I'm off writing my own controller factory. So then if I want to use something like a, a control container, I have to hook it up to MVC. I have to tell Windsor how to make controllers, and I have to tell... So, you know, I basically plug ASP.NET MVC's controller factory mechanism into my container framework of choice. Am I there so far? Uh, yes. Okay. Yep, that's correct. And then this is where, now, this is where I think I understand what you just said is that this is where MVC, uh, MVC Turbine comes in. Correct. Okay. And then you provide all sorts of, uh, well, helper functions and layers and framework and conventions. Like it's almost like you're a um, an IOC container aggregator that knows about ASP.NET MVC. Uh, actually, that is a, that is a really great way of putting it. Is that um, that the fact that Turbine knows knows about IOC and knows about MVC and kind of uh, bridges that you know it, it translates between the two. Okay, so you're saying that I could go off right now and write the Scott IOC container. And build a whole dependency injection framework called, you know, Scott.net. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't have to teach it about MVC. Correct. Okay. It would just be a standard, generic, non-ASP.NET specific thing. And then what would I have to do to make it really, really easy for people to, to use it? And how would MVC Turbine help me? Uh, the, the easiest way to do that is say, we, we take Scott.net, um, and, and take it at, at face value at what it does. Um, and we bridge it, we actually plug it into ASP.NET by actually uh, implementing an iService locator interface, which is a contract that Turbine provides. And actually, this is very similar to the common service locator project mm -hmm. that's out there in CodePlex. And what is a service locator in the generic sense, though? A service locator is, um, I would pull it, I would call it as a... Um, as an aggregate or knower of types. Knower so, of types. Okay. Yes. 
as in census, you query it and saying, hey, locator, I need you to locate me of, of something of this type of, of, of iFoo or okay. iBar. And you don't know how it does it. You just know that it provides that for you. Hey, it's Alternate Universe Scott Hanselman. Going to thank our sponsors for making this free show possible. We've been doing Hanselman it's for almost four years now, and we really couldn't do it without Telerik. So I want to tell you about some of the stuff they're working on. If you've already started developing with Silverlight, then uh, you probably need a solid testing tool to do your Silverlight UIs. Unfortunately, though, a lot of the tools available today only uh, help you with unit testing. There's not really a good way to simulate the actual behavior of those end users, unless you spend days and weeks doing a lot of manual testing. But the guys at Telerik have got a new point-and-click UI testing tool for Silverlight called Web UI Test Studio. And the beauty is that you can quickly record your tests with a cross-browser recorder. You can enrich them with code if you've got really complex scenarios. And on top of that, it supports all the standard controls as well as the Telerik enhanced controls. You can verify not only Silverlight, but even complex AJAX applications. Best part, Web UI Test Studio lives in Visual Studio, so you don't have to leave your favorite developer environment. You can check it out at Telerik.com slash web hyphen testing hyphen tools. And be sure to thank Telerik for supporting the show on their Facebook fan page at facebook.com slash Telerik. Okay, and this is all about separation of concerns. We hear this all the time. This yes, is a correct. this is a locator. It's like a, it's a contact lookup. It's like I really need an iFoo. Do you know where you could find me one? And he's yep. like, I'll handle it. Exactly. Yep. And and if and if that iFoo has any dependencies, Able manage all that for you. Right. Okay. You don't have to worry about it. So then but I would it, implement an iService locator for the Scott.net framework. Correct. Okay. And and that. Um, that actually will then plugged into uh, the MVC Turbine runtime saying, hey, here's the iServers locator implementation that I want you to use. Mm-hmm. And it goes, all right, uh, Turbine doesn't know anything about Unity, doesn't know anything about uh, Structure Map or any of those IOC containers. It knows about that iServers locator interface, that, you know, that contract that it uses, uh, which allows it to easily switch from Unity to Windsor to uh, Structure Map and so forth, or to Scott.net. Okay, okay. So if I go off and I want to write Nerd Dinner, which is all about Nerd Dinners, mm-hmm. not about IOC, and I want to go off and use uh, Structure Map or Unity or any number of different, or maybe I want to try a couple of different containers, somewhere in there I'm going to be writing a bunch of code to teach Nerd Dinner about dependency injection and or de- teach my dependency injection framework about how I want it to behave, none of this moves my business of making having nerds have dinner forward. So this is where Turbine simplifies all of that. It, it's a it's a it's almost impo- it's it imposing a convention on how MVC should interact with any DI um, framework? Yeah, actually, I would say that because um, a perfect example of that is um, if you if you search for uh, structure map or ninject um, samples, one of the th- or things they do is they explicitly say, "I'm going to register," you know, uh, "I'm going to register controllers this way." Um, and there's plenty of code samples again out there show you that. With Turbine, you don't have to tell it that. Turbine knows that. Hey, I'm an MVC. I need to register a controller, so it does that for you. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it, it doesn't ask permission. It doesn't ask you how it should do it. It just says, if it's an I controller, uh, and I have to go down to I controller, not to just controller itself, because mm-hmm. uh, that is the least you know common denominator. And it's I'm going to take that you know that type, and I'm going to register with with a container. You know, end of story. No, you know, um, just because you you want that. Okay. So there's a custom controller factory that comes with it. So when I get when I download MVC Turbine, I get this new controller factory, and this now replaces the default and resolves where controllers should be found through the service locator, and then subsequently through whatever framework I've chosen. Yep, that is correct. My URLs will still work the same. I say slash home, I get the home controller. That's not going to change routing or anything like that. But my it'll it'll then allow my controllers to have dependencies, and those dependencies will be uh, satisfied using my framework of choice. Yep, that is correct. Okay, so that's the custom controller factory. Then, what about other 
components that I might want to do in uh, dependency injection on. I might want to separate out like routes or modules or other other things that aren't necessarily controllers. Um, yeah, uh, the the one that I I like to show um, is um, view engines, right? Um, now, mm-hmm. typically, you don't want to do an IOC uh, on a view engine. Uh, you, you might, in case you want to do something interesting or, or something uh, uh, clever for uh, tag building. Um, for example, Spark, the Spark View Engine does some uh, allows you to plug in an IOC to resolve some of the specific types. Um, but in particular, with view engines, the way you want to do to use them within your MVC application, you want you may want to switch from one to another. Because you really, you know, you can, the, the framework allows you to, and since there are enough separation of those concerns, um, it is very easily for your controller to talk to, you know, Spark View Engine or Web View Engine. So Turbine, again, eagerly, you know, by that convention that we talked about earlier, goes out and finds all those view engines and registers them with ASP.NET NVC. So in case you do want to add that piece to your view or to your view engine, it's automatically added there out of the box. Okay. Uh, another another instance is model binders, right? So um, a model binder is the, I will call it uh, the, the, the little known secret of, of the ASP.NET MVC world that allows you to take any data from your uh, from your route, from your request form or, or whichever pieces and allows you to build up that model, that piece that gets passed as a controller action. Right. It takes it takes the HTTP, uh, the entire context, usually in the form of an HTTP post, and effectively deserializes your object out of that HTTP information. So if you've got a bunch of form uh, fields, first name and last name, and you have a person object, the model binder is the thing that figures that out. And it sounds great, and it's a fun demo, Except when you have really complicated objects and you need to write a custom model binder and teach it about your objects. Yep, that is correct. So one of the things that, you know, I, I, I personally do a lot of, uh, custom model binders just mm-hmm. because I, I deal with complex examples. I know in your blog in the past you've had how to get a date time, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, out of it. Um, well, one of the things that Turbine does, it, um, it actually auto wires model binders for you. So it knows which specific type to use. So say, for example, um, let's go with um, foo again, since that seems to be the, the type of choice. Um, if you, I can have a foo model binder that will need some complex logics, and I even need to have a, an iDatabase or an iRepository or, or iWhatever dependency piece on it. Mm-hmm. So that model binder can then um, be injected to your runtime through Turbine, just because it is a, an I model, because it's because it's an I model binder out of the box. So again, Turbine eagerly, eagerly by convention says, "Oh, I need to, I need to take this, put it into the runtime, and then plop it into the system." So that way, it knows how to um, interact with that specific type. So if that foo model binder needs to call the database or needs to interact with another type, it does it. It does it without you know without any any headaches or issues. Okay. Now, how is that different from how I would wire up a model binder or anything else in MVC now? Usually in MVC, I will put that into my global ASAX and I'll just have a one line that says, you know, register model binder, blah, blah, blah. When you need a date time, use the Scott date time model binder. It's one line. It's no problem. How is that not, you know, IOC and dependency injection? It, it's not because if you actually look at the registration of model binders, uh, when you actually tell it, you know, uses the daytime model binders, mm-hmm. it requires an instance of that model binder. Mm. So, so you have to at the at the moment you're going to say, hey, for this foo type or for this specific type, mm-hmm. use this model binder. That model binder is an actual instance. So if you have if this model binder has two dependencies and those dependencies has three dependencies and so on and so on, that all of those will have to be resolved by the moment you say, I'm going to associate these two. Okay. So, so at that point, that's where the problem gets a little more complex. So from the turbine perspective, turbine will automatically um, say, here's the turbine model binder. Mm-hmm. 
uh, which is static. You know, it's, it's got, uh, has one dependency, that service locator we talked about earlier, which gets passed in. And then within it, within that implementation, it serves more of a, a facade. Then it can, then within that facade, it queries all the other model binders and says, Oh yeah, you, you know, you need X. You know, here's a model. Can, do you match it? Yes. All right. Well, spin it out of the container. Mm-hmm. And at that point, any dependencies that that model binder may have are automatically resolved from the container. Okay. So from a developer standpoint, you develop it the exact same way you would develop your controllers or any other pieces. It's just you get that added benefit. I see. So it sounds like in every oppor- every opportunity that MVC Turbine ha- uh, can, any opportunity that it sees, it will take a way that things used to work in ASP.NET and MVC and make it an opportunity for the dependency injection framework to get involved, and then you get all of the, ben- the benefits of dependency injection as a concept. Yep, that is that's correct. One of the ways I like to sp- fr- uh, phrase it is that MVC Turbine will always yield to the container first. So it always asks the container, can you provide this? And if, and if the answer is yes, it, you know, will resolve that and pass it on. If the answer is no, then Turbine will then provide its, its implementation mm-hmm. to sort of, to make it, make it feel like good old MVC again. And is there some performance? I mean, this, I mean, I could hear someone listening and thinking, well, this is going to make everything slow. Uh, there is one performance issue that we have actually um, encountered, and that has to deal with controller resolutions and with attributes. But that's actually being addressed right now for the next release of Turbine. Okay. Um, but since everything happens at at startup, all the registration and all these different things happen in app startup. Mm-hmm. There's really not much any difference from you in using uh, Structure Map Unity or any other uh, IOC. Because it happens at startup, and at the end of the day, it's just it's the same way as calling that IOC, that IOC container. Mm-hmm. The only difference is just there's an extra layer of vendor direction, which is minimal. Okay, so this means that there, are you saying that there's just no discernible or worth measuring performance hit? Like if I have a perfectly good application that works already, and mm-hmm. I'm interested in making the code kind of you know smell better. But I'm afraid of performance. You're saying just don't worry about it. It's it's marginal amounts of performance. Yep, that is correct. Yep. Okay. Well, that's cool. Yep. And I and again, just because I'm not uh, turbine's not doing any of the heavy lifting, um, the IOC is. Ah, I see. So because turbine is a is a thin layer on top of whatever the IOC that's underlying it, any performance issues that you might potentially introduce would ultimately be in the underlying container that you've chosen to use. Exactly. Correct. So what containers do you support out of the box? And is this a thing where, you know, when you have an app, when you have an app, um, an application or a framework that is a collection of adapters, which is effectively what you are, there's always that question of, are you maintaining all the adapters or does everyone go and write their own turbine implementations? I mean, where's the central repository of all things? You know, like, like, like if I made Scott.net, uh, dependency injection framework, do I then supply that to you? Uh, that is a good question. So kind of to, to put it all together is um, out of the box, I'm supporting Unity, um, Castle Windsor, Structure Map, and Inject. And those uh, implementations or those layers are actually being uh, supported by me or by other members of the uh, NBC Turbine core team. Okay. Um, and that's just because... So when, you know, I use Castle Windsor for most, so I'm the one who's out there changing it if, if it ever needs changes. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had people review the structure map and give me feedback on it. I'm the same thing with an inject, but, uh, someone, someone at any given point can take that up or you can take the source code and, you know, and create my inject service locator. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing for like Scott.net. You could be the, the owner of that and saying, here's, you know, since I know Scott.net the best, I will, provides this implementation at whatever uh, fine tuning that it needs, mm-hmm. and and you you download this from me. You don't download it from uh, the MVC Turbine uh, repository. Okay, and I would just have to implement iService Locator for Correct. my uh, ScottService.net thing, and then what yep. what um, assembly would I have to reference? 
uh, you will have to reference the MVC turbine that DLL assembly. And that's it. And that's it. Okay. Now, what about file new project? You know, uh, a lot of times I, I feel like uh, this is all great. And everyone talks about this, but I'm just so lazy because most programmers are really, really lazy people that if it doesn't come out of the box with file new project, I'm not going to really bother. Sure. So what I've done is to kind of appease um, that crowd because I'm I'm the same way at times. Depending on <laughs> depending to on my to appease the my... profoundly lazy. <laughs> exactly. Uh, one of the things that I've done is I've created uh, several templates. So you could go file new, um, then check application, mm-hmm. file new uh, 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 structure map, and so forth. So um, again, those templates are specific to the to the. Um, to the IOC containers that that I and the other members of the team pro, um, support, right? Uh, if obviously, if you want fun for Scott.net, uh, we could do that for you. But at that point, we don't, you know, we don't know what what sure, you will yeah, want. But there at could the be end. dozens yeah. of people out there who want oh, yeah. this kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, actually, one of the things we're talking about, uh, not for this release, for the for the next release, is trying to use an autofac. That's another one we're going to support, okay. or or Linfu. These are all very popular. Uh, you know, they, they're basically like, uh, would you say niche or niche, depending on how you pronounce that? Uh, you know, everyone's got their favorite flavor of ice cream. You know what I mean? I mean, every, I, I probably have six different emails in my uh, inbox from the last month saying I've written, uh, an IOC container. Can you check it out? It seems to be like it's the, it's the thing, it's the thing that people want to write. They want to write their own and they want to do it their way. Exactly. It's like uh, designer bags, right? So IOC containers are the designer bags. Yeah. That network. They're all bags, though, right? No one's doing anything remotely. Exactly. None of them have solar panels or anything. Well, maybe exactly. some of them do, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the reason why I ended up supporting all these ones. And each of them are finicky within themselves. You know, you, 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 I've learned so much about each individual mm-hmm. IOC container by providing this shim that, oh my gosh, I was like, wow, you know, some features I like about X, some features I like about Y, and and that that's I think that's the best way to, to to take it take that knowledge of ILC to the next level is how each individual takes it. So, and now that you've spent so much time looking at all these different bags, I mean, do you have a favorite? Uh, do I have a favorite? I will have to say um, it's my old bag, which is Castle Winter. Really? Just just yeah, just because I, I I know it so well, and um, and some of the features that it provides, uh, like the facility pieces, is it's phenomenal. Really? Um, so the the, yep. the 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 original is still the best, you say? Yeah, exactly. And and again, this is just my style. <laughs> no, this is this is you know my opinion only, and so forth. Um, the one that comes in close second is Autofac, just Autofact. because of hmm. because of the explicitness that it, it that enforces. Well, this will start a very exciting uh, fight in the comments of the show. I hope. As, oh, I, as people espouse their uh, their favorite IOC containers. I wouldn't doubt it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Javier Lozano, for talking about MVC Turbine. People can see this where on the web? Uh, if you go to mvcturbine.codeplex.com, that's the main download site for that. Fantastic. And Javier is on uh, the web with his own blog, and he's also on Twitter, and we'll have those links in the show notes. Thank you so much for uh, chatting with me today. Uh, thank you, Scott. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 